This is KGW News at Sunrise. We really saw the bridge fall right after he moved off. Uh, it was because it was a first responder who was telling him to move off of the bridge. That's Maryland's governor talking about how one survivor got off the bridge right before it collapsed after a cargo ship crashed into it early this week. Coming up, new details on the NTSB's investigation. And taking a live look from Moda Center this morning. It will be packed all weekend long for Women's March Madness. Coming up, how Portland police are stemming up patrols in the area to make sure everyone stays safe while watching the best of the best compete. And a tortoise whose leg was amputated can once again explore his surroundings, all thanks to innovation and a 3D printer. Ahead on Sunrise, the remarkable story of how Mr. Cookie got back on his feet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this Thursday, almost a Friday. I'm Christine Pitawanich. And I'm China Green. We're going to go right to weather because yeah. there's a lot to talk about Mr. today. Mr. Cookie quoted as saying, I'm faster than ever, by the way. Is that what he said? Yeah. Mm, okay. Said. Here's a look at our uh, radar this morning. We have uh, numerous showers out there, and we've seen lightning around Newport. We've seen it around Tillamook, and then a new fresh lightning strike, if you will, right on the, the border between Tillamook and Clatsop counties, about four miles offshore. We have snow down to 3,000 feet in the Cascade. That's white on the radar and a reminder of the the bright colors and the yellow some heavier scattered downpours it's been kind of a lull in the action or fairly quiet for the last couple of hours uh, in downtown Portland but we will see numerous showers come and go today and the headline is the storm threat is real because we've already had thunderstorms we've already had hail we expect more today through the evening hours. We're at 48 right now. The temperature is not going to budge much. I have us 49 at noon and at most I have us getting up to 53 this afternoon. So that is a warm raincoat you will need on. That's your update. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thanks, Rod. We begin this six o'clock hour with the latest on the deadly bridge collapse in Baltimore. NTSB investigators are releasing new details this morning, giving a bit more insight into what led up to the crash. Officials say more than 700 tons of corrosive flammable materials and batteries were on the ship when it collided with the bridge. NBC's Tom Costello has more. In Baltimore this morning, a clearer picture now emerging of the disastrous crash that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge. NTSB investigators have for the first time boarded the cargo ship, still covered in mangled metal. It's just utter devastation. Along with initial interviews of the crew, investigators have now downloaded the ship's voice data recorder, or VDR. The initial timeline shows alarms started sounding at 1.24 a.m. Tuesday. Two minutes later, the ship's pilot made an urgent call for any nearby tugboats to assist. The pilot radioed again a minute later, saying the ship had lost all power. Traffic cameras showed the ship approaching the bridge before the feed cuts out two minutes later when the massive vessel struck the span. The ship had no tugs at all helping it navigate through the waters before it hit the bridge? That's correct. It's a straight, uh, straight uh, shot through uh, the channel, so there are no tugs with... Uh, the vessel at that time. Police dispatch audio shows officers radio to stop traffic less than 30 seconds after that distress call, showing officers discussing the crew on the bridge in the moments before the collapse. Once you get here, I'll go grab the uh, workers on the key bridge and then stop the outer loop. dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Nearly 25 feet below the water surface, dive teams have discovered a pickup truck with two victims inside. Authorities have now called off the search for four remaining victims, calling it a salvage operation, saying the water is simply too treacherous, filled with dangerous debris. Maryland's governor sharing how one survivor managed to walk away from the terrifying ordeal. We literally saw the bridge fall right after he moved off. Uh, it was because it was a first responder who was telling him to move off of the bridge. Now the focus shifts to the daunting task of reopening this vital port with 8,000 workers directly impacted and concerns of supply chain disruptions. We are concerned about implications that will ripple out beyond the immediate region. That was Tom Costello reporting. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we checked in with the pilots who guide ships on the Columbia. The tragedy in Baltimore understandably hit hard for them, and it's also causing them to re-examine the systems that ships use to navigate under our bridges. I was heartsick at first. I mean, it's a terrible catastrophe. Safety is our goal on this river, to never have an incident like that. 
Jeremy Nielsen is the Columbia River Pilots president. He says he was part of a meeting just yesterday with the Coast Guard and steamship operators. They're considering adding sensors to boats that go underneath a lower bridge in Longview to make sure there's enough room for them to pass through no matter the water level. As of now, the ships just use estimates. Nielsen says the Columbia River pilots go through years of training. Now to some local morning headlines. Police are investigating the death of a 17 year old Woodburn student after a single vehicle crash. We don't know much this morning, but police have told us that alcohol and speed were both a factor. The crash happened just around 2 a.m. at the intersection of North Boone's Ferry Road and Vanderbeck Lane. Authorities say the 17 year old was driving. A 14 year old passenger is in the hospital with life threatening injuries this morning. Another 19 year old passenger was transported for non life threatening injuries. The Woodburn School District told families that a crisis response team will be at the high school Monday for staff and students. And take a look at your screen. Have you seen this woman? Vancouver police are looking for her. 61 year old Christina Assay's husband and co-workers reported her missing earlier this week. Her car was found in Vancouver yesterday. Investigators say they consider her disappearance to be suspicious. If you have any information, call Vancouver police. The suspect in an early morning stabbing and standoff that we first brought to you as breaking news yesterday morning has been charged with attempted murder. The victim is a woman who was found stabbed on a nearby Max platform. Police say Becca Nebi Dekebo has been charged with attempted murder and constituting domestic violence. So that means 29 year old suspect likely knew the victim. Officers attempted to negotiate with Dekebo for almost eight hours until officers entered an apartment and took him into custody. The woman who was stabbed is expected to survive. And that's a look at your Thursday morning headlines. Some of college basketball's best women's teams are set to play in Portland this weekend in the NCAA tournament. Tens of thousands of fans will be making their way to the Moda Center for the Sweet 16 and Elite 8 games. Those games nearly sold out and Portland police are stepping up patrols in the Rose Quarter to make it safe. Devin Haskins is live outside the Moda Center this morning with a look at PPB's plan. Good morning, Devin. Yeah, good morning. This area here on the Rose Corner and outside the Moda Center is going to be full of life and fans starting tomorrow as uh, they descend to watch some of the country's best stars that are coming here to play at the Moda Center. And that includes Juju Watkins from USC or hometown's uh, Beaverton's uh, own Cameron Brink playing with Stanford. Portland Police, though, to keep everybody safe, will have more of a show down here than normal. Police Chief Bob Day tells us that the Bureau will have at least two additional teams of officers walking around the Moda Center and downtown throughout the games. Ten officers will also be on motorcycles, escorting the team buses and providing extra security. And if you're driving down here or just happen to be down here, expect lots of extra traffic. It will be congested. Um, you know, once again, getting the teams in and out, getting, you know, uh, making sure the fans can get in and out. So, you know, just be aware that, you know, starting tonight through Monday, we're going to have a lot of stuff going on over there. Those games run uh, tomorrow through Monday. And if you're hoping to catch the Beavers, they play tomorrow at 1130. They won't be here, though. They are the host team, but they are in the Albany region. So they play tomorrow at 1130 in New York. You can watch that on ESPN. Back to you. Yeah, sending good vibes their way. Thanks for that report, Devin. From Moda Center to now Seattle, T-Mobile Park to be specific, because it is opening day and baseball fans across the country getting excited. The Mariners kick off their season at T-Mobile Park tonight against the Red Sox. First pitch is at 7:10. I went to the home opener last year, and well, I thought it was going to be extremely fun because I worked in Seattle and yeah. I was told you have to go. Mm -hmm. So I went and it was the worst baseball experience <gasps> I've ever had. Why? Because it was packed. Okay. okay. The okay. pitch clock made it shorter. So to wait in line to go to the restroom or order any food was 30, 45 minutes. So you're mm. missing almost half the game. So I'm, I'm going to do a, <laughs> a noon game. <laughs> the, the noon games on a Tuesday okay. are, yeah. are the ones to go to. What does stink when there's that line to go to the bathroom. Oh, it's right? packed. Yeah. And I don't get up to go to the bathroom until I really have to go. Mm. So then the line's even more of an issue. Oh, no. <laughs> I like to watch on TV. <laughs> TV's great. Oh, right, can you hear it? That's hail coming down. Scott Ashley sent me this. I see the water. I'm not sure if this is along the river or if it's at a bay up along the coast, but pretty good hailstorm. The biggest hail in the area yesterday was down around um, Albany. We had hailstones nearly the size of dimes down there. 
And then in the Cully neighborhood of Northeast, Brandon Bachman caught the wind and you can hear the rain coming down. We're going to have a do over today. We had quite a few lightning strikes yesterday, mainly in that five to six o'clock hour. That's when we had the hail report that was nearly dime sized down outside of Albany. We have the same, uh, same setup today with this big low offshore. The low by tomorrow is down across uh, or off the shore of California. And as it goes to the south, Overnight tonight, our rain chance starts to fall apart, and eventually tomorrow the rain chance becomes zero, and then we springboard into a great weekend. But uh, for today, the low is there. It's going to feed us gusty south winds, numerous showers, heavy downpours at times with hail, and I think we will see more lightning detected. We've had lightning along the coast at times this morning. There was a recent strike just north of uh, Tillamook, about four miles out to sea. We got snow where we see the white down to 3,000 feet up in the Cascades. Right now coming into Portland, it's quiet, but you see there's some heavy rain out in uh, Yamhill County right now. Uh, Pretty good visibility. 48 is the temperature. We're not going to budge much, though, so the temps this morning are not bad. But when it rains, it will be 48 this afternoon. So we're not going to really see much warming, as I mentioned. It's 40 out in the Dows. We have 30s when you get east of the Cascades. Current temperatures there. Future cast, just note, it looks the same this morning as it does at 1 o'clock this afternoon, as it does at 7 p.m. this evening. So that's ongoing. Numerous showers. The bright colors representing downpours. And again, absolutely expecting more hail reports, absolutely expecting more reports of thunder and lightning in the area. If you're headed up to the Cascades, the passes do show snow cover at this hour. Now, daytime temps will be near to above freezing at pass level. This shows government camp at 36. Um, but again, if you get an intense shower, there could be some snow cover, um, recover the pavement. So just FYI on that. Uh, the resorts, Meadows and Timberline both say eight inches over the past 24 hours. So that's thumbs up. Good news for the snowpack and, of course, for skiers and boarders. About 50 in Salem today. The numerous showers, the gusty south winds, 15 to 30. Similar numbers up through southwest Washington. Friday really turns out to be nice. A lingering shower chance that ends. Sunshine opens. We get 59. And then nothing but sun Saturday, Sunday, Monday with temperatures up into the 60s. So I hope you have time to enjoy that. Easter Sunday looks to be a nice morning if you're going to sunrise services as well. That's your update.